So yes, if you will turn to Galatians and be in chapter 5, we're going to start at verse 22. Actually, we'll start at verse 19. And so we just finished listening to Psalm 46. The reason I like that band isn't necessarily that it's my preferred style of music, but they're one of the few groups that are actually turning the Psalms into songs. And so, and they're doing a good job of it. And so I like a lot of their music because it's scripture. And Shane and Shane. And so, and there's a better version of that song on YouTube, but it doesn't have the lyrics on the screen. So I figured we wanted to sing along. So, amen. We needed the, I took the weaker version without the choir. It was a trade-off. It was choir or lyrics. I want the lyrics. Because yeah. we were the choir. Praise the Lord. Sing it all. Make a joyful noise ourselves. But the point of Psalm 46 there is where else would we go but to the Lord of hosts? We have no other refuge. We have no other place to run. We have no other place to go but to the Lord. He is our portion and he is our deliverer. He's all we have in this life. Everything else that you put your hope in, everything else that you rely on, everything else that you trust in, will at some point disappoint you. It's a guarantee. Your bank account's going to disappoint you at some point. Your car is going to disappoint you. Your house is going to disappoint you. Your family, even if you love them, at certain points they are going to disappoint you. The only refuge that you have the only guarantee in life that you have is that you can take refuge in the Lord and that he will be there for you. You may not always like his answer in the moment. You might not always like what's going on in the moment, but in the end, you will look back and go, thank you. There have been times in my life where I have prayed for things fervently and really wanted them. I thought, Lord, why didn't you give this to me? Why didn't you answer this prayer for me? Lord, how could you not hear me crying out? Kind of like Peter we talked about last week in the boat going, Lord, don't you care that we are perishing? And sometimes I've prayed for things and, and, and been baffled as to why the Lord wouldn't answer my prayer the way I wanted it. But then we look back later on with the benefit of time, and sometimes it takes years. Sometimes it takes a decade. But at some point, you'll look back sometimes on the things you prayed for and you'll go, thank you, Jesus, that you did not give me that. Thank you. Thank you. Because you knew so much better for me than I knew. You knew what I needed and I did not need that. Kind of like the people that pray fervently every week to win the lottery. Oh, Lord, if you would just let me win the lottery, which is an extreme example. But there are people that pray every week, Lord, please let me win the lottery. The Lord doesn't let them win the lottery because he knows full well that it would be destruction for them. It would just be poison in their lives. That you would just inject an enormous stronghold into their household. And so he doesn't do it because it would be bad for them. You know, I might want to pray for an all-you-can-eat prime rib buffet to open up in Memphis with high-quality, dry-aged, USDA prime smoked prime rib. That would be great. I would love for there to be an all-you-can-eat Sunday brunch full of crab legs and prime rib. Good quality prime rib. Not like Golden Corral prime rib. Real prime rib. Not that USDA general inspected tough-as-boots prime rib. No, I want a real one. Tender one. Tenderloin. That's right. Amen. The kind that doesn't require a reinforced jaw tender tendon to get through. <laughs> but it wouldn't be good for me for that to open up. It'd be bad. Because I would view it as a personal challenge to go in there and see if I could get them to lose money on my plate. And that's not something I need. 
So it would not be good for me to pray for that. Even if I think I want it. And so sometimes we pray for things and we desire things that are bad for us. And so the Lord doesn't answer. And so I don't want you to be discouraged when you pray for things and they don't happen at the speed that you would want or the desires don't get answered. Because so many times the Lord has so much better for you than you could even imagine is possible. And what you think is possible. And so what you have to do during your day is not focus on your needs, your wants, your desires, the things that the Lord's not answering in your prayers, but instead look up to the Lord and go, Lord, how can I serve you today? How can I love better today? If you will focus on loving one another, if you will focus on loving God, if you will focus on serving God, if you will make that your first and only priority in the day, Miracles will begin to happen in your life. Unbelievable miracles. Problems will start to go away. Amen. It is amazing what kindness will do. Amen. It is, especially now. Because people are getting meaner and meaner all the time. They are. <coughs> and it's hard to hold back sometimes. I find myself sometimes struggling and I got to remind myself to be kind. All the time. I was almost not kind this evening to a hostess at a restaurant. And I had to catch myself as I was talking to her and I just smiled and I thought she's 19 or 20 years old. And she's just doing what her boss told her and she don't know any better. Mm. You know, and she's not capable of looking at a big picture and making an interpretation. She's just doing what she was told. What am I going to yell at her for? It's crazy. She's wrong, but that doesn't matter. I just was nice to her. Figured I'll talk to somebody else about it. Kindly. Because there's no reason not to be kind. And so Paul is writing the letter of Galatians that we opened up. He is writing this letter to a church that was full of Gentile believers that had come to know the Lord and they had received the Lord with great joy. And then after they came to know the Lord and received the Lord with great joy, Jewish believers that had come to know Jesus, some of them came and started worshiping there, and they began to inject this idea into the church that they had to follow and comply with all of the teachings of the law. That if they weren't circumcised, they needed to get circumcised. That if... You know, that they should stop eating pork, that they couldn't eat shellfish, that they needed to start observing Shabbat at sundown, that they couldn't, you know, walk further than they were permitted on a Sunday. All of a sudden, they wanted to impose all of these rules on these Gentiles that had found <coughs> joy and freedom in their salvation. And so all of a sudden, now they want to take that and add all of these rules. And Paul is writing to them going, no, that is a false teaching. That is not from God. The whole point of the law was to show you that you couldn't do it on your own and that you needed a way. That you needed love and grace from God, that you needed a bridgeway. That keeping this law was impossible for man. And the point of it was to convict you and show you that, Lord, I can't do this on my own. The best I try, I still can't. Help me. <clears throat> And so once you had your freedom, once you realized that Jesus had bought you with a price, why would you ever want to go back into the slavery and bondage of the law? You're, you've been freed. And that's the language that Paul uses. He, he talks about being under the law and under the rules is like being in chains and in bondage. And Jesus has set you free. Why on earth would you go back? Which is a crazy question. But yet they were fighting that battle. And so he is correcting this heresy that is cropping up in the church. And we have to be careful about heresy cropping up in our churches. It happens all the time. People come up with crazy ideas and then they want to adopt them as theology. <coughs> People come up with side things and they want to make them central. You know, there's a whole group of Christians that, you know, they want to talk about predestination all the time. You know, were you, you know, predestined to go to heaven or not? And, you know, there's, they take three or four verses out of the Bible. <coughs> and they build a whole theology around it. And one of the biggest points that I've always focused on when I'm reading my Bible is what comes up over and over again. 
Focus on the big things first. You know, the Holy Spirit makes it real clear what the big ideas are, the important ideas, because of the things that he talks about over and over and over and over again. You know, it's amazing. We can talk about loving one another, and if you just look through your Bible, that is going to appear in book after book after book after book after book, in passage after passage after passage after passage. It is a central, core, foundational element of Jesus' teaching. Get that right before you start worrying about other stuff. Don't find something that appears twice in Scripture and say, that's going to be my mission statement. <clears throat> that's going to be my central theme. Because it's just not, if it, wasn't, if it was that important, Jesus would have talked about it a whole lot. <clears throat> and so Paul is writing to the Galatians, and I'll, I'll back up a little to verse 513 he says for you were called to freedom brethren only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh but through love serve one another you've been freed from the law you've been freed from bondage you know paul talks about that all things may be lawful but not all things are profitable you've been freed by jesus don't use your freedom to indulge in things that could damage you or damage others. Use your freedom to love one another. Use your freedom to say, hey, you know what? It might be the Sabbath and a day of rest, but that lady's car is broken down with a flat tire, and I'm going to do some work by changing out her tire. Even though it's my day of rest, maybe I'm going to break my rest to help her because she's in distress. I'm going to use my freedom to love not going to use my freedom to go party and go well i've been forgiven because then you are perverting the very sacrifice that jesus made he goes on he goes for the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement you shall love your neighbor as yourself but if you bite and devour one another take care lest you be consumed by one another man ain't that the truth you ever notice when things get a little off kilter and you're in a group and all of a sudden like one person snaps at one person and then somebody else snaps and before you know it, it's knives out and everybody's on everybody else and it's like your circle in the drain and everybody's getting real angry all of a sudden real quick. It's amazing how fast it creeps in. The devil's good at building that hate. But it takes work to build love. And so Paul says, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. In the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. It's tough. It's a tough command. Jesus took it even further when he said, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another even as I have loved you. That you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus truly loved his disciples like he loved himself. And in fact, he went even beyond that and was willing to die for them. Which is why Jesus says, greater love have no one than this. And that they would lay down their life for another. And so he goes on, he says, I, but I say, walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Amen. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. So Paul's referring here to this battle that's going on. You've been redeemed. You've been saved. You know Jesus. You have accepted him as your savior. But yet we all find ourselves struggling, right? From time to time. We find ourselves wanting to go back towards our old habits, our bad habits. Or sometimes we find ourselves exploring new bad habits. Maybe it wasn't even a bad habit that we had before, but now we have a different bad habit. And we're in, a, we're in this opposition. But we have the Holy Spirit inside of us, and he's telling us. He's counseling us. Don't do that. Don't do that. It's not good for you. But your flesh... Your sinful nature 
It fights back and it goes, no, I want that. Your selfishness kicks in. I want to do it anyway. Do you ever have that moment inside of you where you are looking at something that you know you should not do? You realize you should not do it. In fact, you might even step away from it and go, I'm not going to do it. And you go, no, I'm going to do it. I want to do it. Yeah. This morning. This morning. I had some peanut butter and jelly. It's delicious. I was supposed to have a protein shake. Holy Spirit told me to have a protein shake. My sinful nature said to make some peanut butter and jelly sandwiches with extra jelly and extra peanut butter. And it was delicious. It was. It was good. And I enjoyed it, but I felt guilty afterwards because I knew I shouldn't be eating that. I don't need that. It's not good for me. But I did it anyway. And that's a small little minor example. I mean, it's not like I, I went to the liquor store and bought a bottle of whiskey or... I'm justified now. You know, I did not. <laughs> and it's sin either way. Amen. It doesn't matter, little or big. It was wrong. I shouldn't do it, and I did it. And so that battle was going on inside of me. And... One of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. What happened there is my self-control lapsed. Didn't work. I let it go. And so there's this war that's going on inside of you. And you have to put Jesus, you have to put God front and center in front of you all the time so that as these moments come up where you are battling the flesh and the spirit, you can stay strong in the spirit and go, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to walk away. I'm just going to get away from it. You know, Proverbs says that the wise man sees danger and takes refuge. He flees. But the fool <coughs> sees danger and proceeds on anyway. One of the wisest things I've learned is that when you see something that you know is tempting you, something that you should not do, a problem that you are going to struggle with, the best thing you can do is just to leave, get away, get out of the area. Just get away from it. Who cares what people think? If you know you're about to break down in a struggle, just walk away. Just get out of there. Treat it like a burning building. Time to go. You know, something bad's going to happen. The best thing you can do is not be there. <laughs> Just don't be there. <laughs> it's always the best defense if the police show up. <clears throat> what happened? I wasn't there. I don't know. I left. I felt like things were going to go bad and I got out of there. <laughs> I don't know what happened. I don't know who was there after me. I have no knowledge that can help you because I was not there. Safest place to be. Because when you're there, even if you don't do something wrong, a lot of times you get caught up in it. Your mere presence can be a problem. People go to jail for just being somewhere. Wrong place, wrong time. People do die that way. You see danger, get away. Best place you can be is not there. And Paul goes on, and now he's going to list out the deeds of the flesh, <clears throat> the deeds of sin. He goes, they're evident. Immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, <clears throat> enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissension, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing. Things like these which I forewarn you just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. It's a big statement. It's a scary statement. But what Paul is saying is that if you're doing all of this all the time, this is in direct opposition to the will of God and the Holy Spirit. And if you have received the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is inside of you and you are desiring to battle your sinful nature, then these things should be dying, not growing. These things should be fading. 
not getting bigger. And if you look up and you say, oh, no, I know Jesus, I love the Lord, and you have done nothing but all of this, you fight all the time, you're angry, you're drunk, you gamble, you're sleeping around, you're, you're addicted to pornography, you're just doing everything wrong. The question has to be asked, do you know Jesus? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. If these things are abounding in you, then you really must ask yourself. Because people that do these things are not people that are walking with the Lord. And he goes on and he says, but the fruit of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience. Patience. That's a tough one to learn. The only way to learn it is by enduring things that make you not patient. I prayed once to the Lord for patience. I remember. It's a mistake. We'll tell you. He taught me patience. He did. And I learned how, I found out how you learn patience. Through trial. You learn it more and more. Marshall will tell you. He's infinitely more patient than he was five years ago. It's been a hard road, though. For everybody. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. These are the things that should be growing in you. These are the marks of somebody that knows the Lord. You should look back a year... <laughs> After you know the Lord, and these things should be bigger than they were a year ago. A year later, they should be bigger. Every month, they should be growing. You know, people should look at you and go, you know, he's kind. You know, that's a guy that's willing to put, him, put somebody else before him. That's a guy that's willing to sacrifice. That's a guy that puts a smile on my face when he walks into the room. He's concerned with how I feel and wants to see what he can do to help me. The fruit of the Spirit. The evidence of Jesus inside of you. Is there any evidence that you know the Lord? I think Adrian Rogers used to say that, you know, there's no such thing as a Christian in the secret service. You know, if there's no evidence of your Christianity, it's a problem. Being a Christian isn't like being a CIA agent. It's not about blending in with the world. It's about being salt and light. It's about being the aroma of Christ. People should know. <coughs> For those who belong to Christ, Jesus have crucified the flesh, which is passions and desires. You've put those things to death. Some might fight harder, but you're putting the things of the flesh to death. The immorality, the impurity, the things that we read about, those are the things that should be crucified inside of you. Those are the things that you should be killing through the help of the Holy Spirit, working on them one at a time. <clears throat> if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. <clears throat> Envy will steal your joy. One of the fastest ways to lose your joy as a Christian is to envy somebody else. <clears throat> Go look what he's got. Why don't I have that? Coveting. Looking at something else. It's a dangerous activity. And I'm going to tell you that Satan is great at creating coveting. Amen. And social media may be the very best tool ever invented <laughs> for creating envy and coveting. Just yesterday, I was scrolling through Instagram, and there was some promoted post of a real estate agent showing a $50 million penthouse in New York City. I started watching the video, and he was giving the little tour. Before I knew it, I was thinking, man, would it be great to live there? You know, and you start wanting it. You start desiring it. And all of a sudden, I started feeling less happy about what I had. And I had to come to my senses and go, wait a minute. What's wrong with you? I wouldn't even want that. 
Started thinking about the number of rooms he walked through and the cleaning crew that would be required. Taxes. The taxes, oh my God. <laughs> taxes on a $50 million penthouse in Manhattan have got to be 100000 a month or more. Oh yeah. And maintenance and upkeep on those properties isn't a joke. <coughs> no joke. You got your homeowners association fee and all that doorman 24 hours and that pool and all those resources probably another seven thousand a month before you start going you go oh my god that's not a blessing that's not something to envy that's a millstone around your neck that would drown you if you inherited it you'd want to sell it as quick as you could before you bankrupted you it's not a blessing but envy the devil loves to create envy. And TikTok and Instagram are great at it. Because he'll take your eye right where your weakness is. <coughs> you know, a lot of stuff on Instagram is borderline pornography. I mean, it would have been pornography 10 or 15 years ago, but the standards changed so much that now it's not. But it really is. And he'll take you there. Make you full of envy and lust. And it'll steal your joy. And so he goes, let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. Don't envy what somebody else has. Don't measure yourself against somebody else. The only thing you should measure yourself against is what the Lord has asked you to do. And are you doing it? Are you growing in Jesus? Because everybody has a job that the Lord has given them. And it doesn't matter what your job is. It matters how you do it. It matters how you serve the Lord. Martin Luther King gave a sermon once, I remember listening to at a church. And he said, even if you are a street sweeper, you should sweep that street so well and with such passion that even the angels in heaven would go there was a great street sweeper. Because in all labor there is profit. In all work, there is profit. And if the Lord has assigned you a specific labor, then you should do it heartily and with joy as to serve the Lord because he's the only one you're out to please. And if the Lord has handed you a bucket and some paint and said, I want you to paint that wall, then you should paint that wall as if Jesus is going to walk by and inspect it. And you want to please the living Lord by going, Lord, I have painted this wall to the very best of my ability. Because there is no shame in any work if it is the work that the Lord has given you. The only thing that matters is serving the Lord and pleasing the Lord. And if the Lord gives you the work, then go, thank you, Jesus. Let me do this work to your great glory. He goes, brethren, if even, a, even if a man is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such one in a spirit of gentleness. Each one looking to yourself, lest you too become tempted. Bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. <clears throat> we all slip up. <clears throat> help your brothers. You see somebody struggling, help bring them back. Don't condemn them. Don't be a Pharisee with a rock in your hand going, I caught you. Amen. Amen. Don't do that. Preach. <clears throat> Don't do that at all. Before you know it, there's going to be somebody behind you with an even bigger rock ready to throw to your head. Yeah. That's how it works. Amen. Yeah. Don't condemn your brother because when you do, you condemn yourself. Come on, Paul. Preach. Man, we need to hear that. Come on, preach, Paul. Because we all have sin. We all have weakness. Now, Jesus talks about the speck in your neighbor's eye while you ignore the log in yours. Tell it. Tell it. And Tell Paul is seeing that going on in this church. He is seeing people condemning one another instead of bringing them back into the fold. If you see your friend slip up, if you see your neighbor slip up, help them. Go, brother. Man, I see that you just, I see that you're doing this and, I, and that's not what the Lord wants. Let's pray about it right now and ask for Jesus to help you. <clears throat> and let's pray right now for me too because I'm struggling with this. And confess your sins to one another. And help one another. 
and strengthen one another. Build each other up. Don't tear each other down. What good is a torn down house? Only a fool tears down. The Proverbs, it talks about the foolish woman that rages against her home and tears it down. Don't be a destroyer. Because the devil's the one that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He goes on, for if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. We are all nothing apart from Jesus. And when you think you're doing something, and when you think you're right, and when you think, man, I've got it going on, you are deceiving yourself because the only thing good in you, the only thing of value in you, the only thing that has any measure of worth whatsoever is the Holy Spirit inside of you and the work that you do through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything that you do of your own strength is entirely worthless. In Isaiah, it says, all your good deeds are like filthy rags in the eyes of God because you are unclean. You are sinful. You have blood on your hands or in your heart. And apart from the redeeming power of Jesus, there's nothing good in any of us. That's why we need him. He finishes up this section here and he says, but let each one examine his own work. And then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to another what i was just talking about the lord has assigned you to be a street sweeper then sweep that and sweep that street as if the lord jesus christ has come to you and said this is what i really need from you because it's really important you're doing kingdom work that i need and you go yes jesus i will do that work it's not always glamorous to be scrubbing pots in the kitchen or to be cleaning toilets But it's important work. It needs to be done. And you should do it with the joy of the Lord. In service to the Lord. And let the one who is taught the word share all good things with him who teaches. (coughs) Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows... This he will also reap. (laughs) Brothers in Christ, your love for one another should be the central thing in your life. How can I serve the Lord and serve my neighbor? If you will put those two things front and central in your walk, in your day, in your waking breath... You will go to bed at the end of the night and go, praise God, this has been a day where I have grown in the Lord Jesus and not gone backwards. And every day that you grow in Jesus is a good day. That's a good, good day. Let's pray. Almighty Father, Heavenly King, Lord, thank you for tonight. Oh God, Lord, I pray that if there is someone here tonight who has not accepted you, who is still caught in the bondage of sin, Lord, who is still practicing the sins of the flesh, who is still ensnared by the trap of the devil, engaged in immorality, that tonight would be the night that they would desire to lay down those chains of oppression and go, Lord, I want to be free. Lord, I want to know you. Lord, your word says that, but we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus. And so, Lord, I pray that if there is somebody who doesn't know you, that tonight they would pray for your grace, Lord. They would pray for your forgiveness. They would repent before you and go, Lord, I believe in you. Lord, I believe that you came to this earth, that you suffered, that you bled, and that you died for me, Lord. And that you rose again from the dead, Lord, and that you are alive. And Lord, I accept you as my Savior. I accept you as God. I am ready to bow down before you and worship you and obey you all the days of my life. And I'm asking you to forgive me, Lord. And to put in me a clean heart. And give me a new spirit, Lord. 
Oh God, for those of us that do know you, I pray that you would help us to crucify the flesh, Lord. Yes, Lord. That you would help us to put to death the immoralities that we struggle with. Yes, Lord. That you would help us to conquer the generational sins and strongholds that have been keeping us down and in bondage. Yes, Lord. Lord, that you would strengthen us, that you would fill us with your spirit, that you would give us the strength, the stamina, and the power, Lord, to serve you above all, to love one another above all, and to say no to the temptations of the devil, Lord, to say today, I will not. I will not slip up. I will not go down. Yes, I will serve you. Yes, God. With every breath, I will obey you. Yes, God. And with every thought, I will worship you. Yes, Lord. I will put you in my heart, and I will do nothing except that which you would command me. Oh, Lord, I pray that you would pour your spirit out upon this place. Yes, Lord. That the Holy Spirit would flow through this building, yes, Lord. God. That you would pour revival out in here. Lord, I pray for your mighty hedge of protection around this facility, Lord. Allow not one thought of the enemy to even pierce the walls of this building, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would give your angels charge concerning the Warrior Center, Lord. That you would protect the Warrior Center. That you would lift up the Warrior Center, Lord. That this would become known as a place of revival in Memphis, Lord. Almighty Father, Heavenly King, Lord, I lift these men up to you. I ask that you would multiply your grace and peace to them. In the matchless name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen.